Greetings, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I just want to do a little intro from David Hawking's book on Revelation, on the different views. And there's a lot of awesome Bible verses to read. I think it's really important to take the Word of God literally and seriously and not leave it up to our own thoughts and minds and hearts to decide what it should mean. And so, I mean, like Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. He describes it in intimate detail. I finished writing on Luke, and you see the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So you see what hell looks like from that perspective right there. You see that there's going to be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. You see that Jesus says that those who hurt little kids or anyone leaning toward him, it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck. So it looks like there's different levels of heaven and hell. Um, you see uh, there's greater condemnation for teachers of certain periods that were not believing on the Messiah. We see uh, a grace-filled way of Jesus talking is saying, if you teach anything less than the Old Testament, the laws, the commandments, you will be least in the kingdom of heaven. That's proof right there that there's levels. He said least, but that's a grace-filled word right there. Because a lot of other uh, things that Jesus says make it look like the path is narrow and few there be that find it. I have to take that seriously. From where God rescued me from, I would not want to take that any less seriously. I'm a born-again believer. He has rescued me from the pit. And why would I still like my sin after that when I realized what I was deceived in to, to be in my own self-will to think I was okay and everything was wrong. So I take the word seriously. It's my food. And so that's one verse. Narrow is the way and few there be that find it, but broad is the highway that leads to destruction and many go in their width. There's other verses that speak of people in the church teaching that say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons, do great miracles and all these works? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That's just one example. There's 10 virgins, five didn't have the oil. So you see so many warnings to not take the word of God and what Jesus did on the cross. What the prophets went through in the Old Testament to get us who the Messiah is, to show us what obedience to God looks like, to take all that and then say, oh, we're all just going to heaven. Jesus is one way. There are many ways to the Father. That's just a lie. Okay, so to see the apostasy, the, the parables speak about an apostasy. Jesus' teaching shows us that a little leaven leavens the whole church. He's speaking about apostasy. You can see the parables fit with revelation. You see the epistles, Peter, John, oh, I love them. And you see Paul, and you see them explaining it. Be not deceived, these do not inherit. So I just do not understand how you take the word any, like, lightly. This is heaven and hell. This is eternity. This is your family. One day you're going to sit before the judgment seat of Christ if you're a born-again believer like me. And the tears are going to be coming out of your eyes that you didn't do more if people didn't make it that are in your family. Maybe stuck in gay marriage, maybe stuck in a, a addiction, maybe stuck in idolatry, stuck. All these verses convict me too. There's going to be a day where we are, we're standing before the judgment seat of Christ as believers. And it looks like there are fake believers who don't even make it to the judgment seat of Christ, who go before the great white throne judgment because they believed on their works or they profaned the name of the Lord. That's the way it looks to David Jeremiah. I go for my own research on it. I search Esword. I look commentaries. I measure scripture with scripture. I am the least, but I see it that way. I've gone out to see it for myself. David Hawking, J Jacob Prash, all these guys that I'm mentioning see it this way. Now let's look at how man can screw it up when he decides that we should be able to choose how we decide the word should be to fit with what my heart, I think it should be this way. No, 
take the word. The word is, I'll give you an example. The word is wholly inspired. It doesn't need us to do anything except let it change us. We see a guy who changed the word of God. He, 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 he turned it into Koine Greek. And he, and he says he went up to the heavens and he, and he found another chapter of John and he got greater revelation and he, and he went and rewrote the whole Bible because God gave him better revelation than what was already inspired. That is just not the way we do it, brothers and sisters. And if it's true, and I believe it is, that many false teachers will have the worst of the hell, then isn't it good to challenge them now so that they can be like, whoa, whoa. Why are we being challenged with, by so many people? These people are supposed to be under us. No, we're allowed to challenge by the word of God. I'm, I'm writing on Thessalonians and Timothy. There's a way to handle it privately, just like Jesus said in Matthew 18. You handle it privately. You bring the brother to, to you and you say, brother, I don't see it this way. And if you gain a brother who's in a deception, you have him for life, he's going to help you out when you are in error, okay? If it's not corrected there, you take it to two or three elders and you look at the, birth, the total word of God and you see two or three things. Let's talk about gay marriage. Satan came after Eve and divided what God put together and Jesus confirmed it in Matthew. Let no man tear apart what God joined together. Jesus confirms that it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than they would have repented if they saw the works he was doing and it would be better for He's using Sodom and Gomorrah to show God's judgment. And they didn't know, they weren't, they weren't aware, but we have Genesis 19 to show God's judgment on the Sodomites. And they wanted to rape and to know the angels carnally. Read Genesis 19. There's two sections right there. We can keep going on, but that's how you take it to them preaching in error. And you say, you're in error. This is a doctrine of demons. Here's two places in the Bible. And then, it's, and then it's cleared, and then you get it out of the church. We see Paul talk about that in the, in the Corinthians, where there's a man having sex with his stepmom. He says, no, you've got to get him out. You've got to let Satan get done with him. And then when he wants grace, you let him back in, and there's a testimony. Jesus showed the same thing in the Matthew 18. If he doesn't listen, treat him like a publican, because it's God, and it's the devil. And it's serving God with your whole heart, you're going to fail sometimes, but you're going to not want to live in sin and in error. And that's the kingdom of God. The other side is error in the kingdom of darkness. When you read John 3, 16, God sent his son not to condemn the world. He, he sent it to save the whole world for all who will believe. But here's the verdict when you keep reading. That those who do not want to live in the light, they, they don't want to bring their deeds there because they like their, their darkness. They want to stay in the darkness and they won't bring them to the light. And that's the condemnation is that they don't bring their deeds to the light and say, help. Historical view of Revelation looks at it like this all already happened. You know what? They believe that it all was fulfilled in 70 AD with Nero. So that is absolutely refuted. By all the scholars who say it was written in 95 AD, I believe it. I don't argue that because I'm not that level of a scholar where I go through all these things and see why do I see it there. I don't, I don't understand that. But I can see it so many other places in Scripture like Daniel. There's never been a false prophet and an um, unholy trinity that Daniel talks about. Okay? We see that there's types and shadow. Nero was one of them. Another one was Antiochus Epiphanes. I'll gift you out my book on Daniel to show you absolute proof that there are, are more things that continue to happen. Who do you think Hitler is? He's another type and shadow of the Antichrist. People who knew Hitler said that he was like embodied with some demonic spirit. He was using drugs. He was into the occult. And he was speaking by the power of Satan. So you can see that their view is wrong. God bless them anyway. I, I know some good ones that are preaching the word of God boldly. They see it a little differently and they're still my brother. They're still preaching holiness. When they stop preaching holiness, they're not, they're not my brother anymore. They're preaching for the enemy. If they're preaching for gay marriage, if they're preaching against what Jesus said, like take drugs, like Jesus isn't enough, you need prescribed drugs, that's an antichrist spirit. Who led you to say something like that? Drugs are a bondage. 
Okay, so the historical view is similar to the preterist view. That these things all already occurred. Symbolical view is allegorical. We're going to just decide what it means. It sees the book as an expression of spiritual truth in symbolical language. The events are not to be taken as literal history, but simply as illustrations of spiritual principles and insights. That makes me just want to... That means it's up to us to decide what, what, what we think it means. No! Look it. Jesus came to fill, fulfill prophecies that the prophets spoke. Born of a virgin. They didn't understand that. They're, I mean, how would they understand it? But that was spoken 700 years in advance by Isaiah in Isaiah 7.14. There's so many other prophecies that are talking about literal fulfillment that they just couldn't understand because it didn't hit their brain that it could be literal. But he came and fulfilled it as literal. So because he did all these literal fulfillments, they would cast lots for his clothes a thousand years beforehand in the Psalms that says that not a bone will be broken. Literal, literal, it happened. Um, he's going to come through the tribe of David, out of the tribe of Judah, the lineage of David, out of the tribe of Judah. He's going to come through a stump because all the men are going to blow it. We can keep going. There's so many other things that he is a literal fulfillment of. When you see it, you can understand, oh, Satan has plans. Oh, divide the family. Oh, separate Eve from Adam. Oh, yeah, now the family's broken apart. Now Adam's going to fall because he doesn't want to be separated from her. Satan's a tricky little monster. He's labeled in, in Revelation as a serpent, as a dragon, as a liar, as, as the deceiver as all these things so we can go revelation fit it with the rest of the bible that's what revelation does it promises a blessing it's going to make you study the whole bible and you're going to see that it is a literal fulfillment the only time it's not is when it says it is like a sea it is like something oh it's it's like okay we got to go figure out what that means and you can figure it out so no on the symbolic view the spiritual view is pretty much the same thing i'm going to spiritualize it my heart's going to figure it out so basically, when you really study the Bible, you're either serving Babylon, you, you read, Daniel's a really easy book to figure out. You can see, oh, okay, they wanted to indoctrinate uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar. Here, let's get them drunk off the good wine, let's give them the good food, and let's indoctrinate them. And Daniel says no. And he starts the Daniel fast. He says, I will not be indoctrinated. You've tried to change my name. My name, my name means God is my judge. I know who my God is, and I'm not going to worship your false gods. And I'm not even going to eat your food. Okay? So we see the whole book of Daniel say you're either buying or you're selling from Christ, what he did on the cross, and from God's word, or you're partaking with Babylon. When I see people chasing every spirit, I'm frustrated. I'm like, you guys, stop trying to pray away word curses. That's not even in the Bible. Now you're trying to list all of these things. Okay, it's good psychology. You've done some math. You figured out some things. But the spirit of Babylon is what we're told to come out of in Revelation. So it's the whole thing. Just the word of God is your food. So get rid of both of those views. Okay, now we're getting into some other ones. The ones that David Jeremiah, David Hawking, um, a, lot, a lot of people have these views. A lot of them. That the word is literal. They, they basically say if, the, if it makes sense literally, then let it be literal. If it doesn't make sense literally, then maybe we just don't you know, know for sure. And it's definitely not a doctrine. Okay, so the literal view sees the book of Revelation as describing both past and future events. It understands the use of symbolic language, but unless the context emphasizes that its words are only symbolical, I told you it is like, there's a lot of, there's, a, there's some areas in that. There's some hard ones to, to really know for sure. Revelation 12, Revelation 18, these are hard ones to know for sure. There's some people that I love that see it a little bit differently. But they still see the literal fulfillment of Jesus coming back for the thousand year millennial reign. And here's why that's so important. Because the Antichrist and the false prophet are put into hellfire forever. Satan is locked up for a thousand years. Okay? So then he's let out and there's one last rebellion from the outskirts that shows us that even with Christ, there's still a rebellion. That's, that's our nature is to rebel. I want to do it my way. Okay, so that shows you it's a call for holiness now. Be sanctified now. You can still have fun. Life is, is more exciting. Being a spiritual warrior, living by the word of God, you're standing 
you know, basically against traffic for the most part. And you're trying to make sure that people see what real faith looks like. Okay, so the literal, the literal. The Bible has a great deal of teaching that can be most difficult for modern man to understand. So that's, that's a cop-out right there. If you love God, you're going to read His Word, especially if you've been as far in the pit as I had been 18 years ago. Okay, especially you see that in the Word. You see the Samaritan woman at the well. She would not shut up. And she was martyred. Mary Magdalene listened better than any of the disciples, maybe except for the son of perdition. He was listening good because he was a thief. Mary Magdalene heard him. She knew. She anointed him. She was the first one that Jesus showed himself to. She was rescued from a lot. Okay, so what we're seeing here is you have to have faith when you read the Bible. Faith that it's God's word. Believe that, okay, I am blown away. There's so many prophecies. In Isaiah it says, I tell you what's going to happen before it happens. There's just so many beautiful scriptures that show that God says things all the way back to Deuteronomy, what not to do. Do not serve all these other gods. Do not do necromancy. Do not do tarot cards. Do not do all these things. These are serving the fallen angels, the dominions, the spirits, the lying spirits. Do not do all these things. Do not do abortion. Their, their way of doing late-term abortion was uh, offering it to Moloch. But if you really understand what led to that, it was a full-blown apostasy from God's word. It was a full-blown adultery, both physical and spiritual, by serving other gods. You're, you're not serving our God. Our God is in his word, and he shows you that. There's so many other prophecies I can go into. He says he's going to scatter Israel for that kind of rebellion as far back as Deuteronomy. He continues to tell him that in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, but he starts to say, I will gather you back up in, in Ezekiel, in Jeremiah. I will bring you back home because I'm going to make my name great. He shows you that I am going to show the world that I'm God. And they're going to have to say that I'm God through your rebellion. His word gets done. Everything that Satan does, everything that has ever happens doesn't happen without God allowing it. It's like a chess game that God already won. We step into it. So back to the regathering. Israel regathered in 1948 is just mind-blowing. The fact that people who have... I, I pray for Israel because I know i got a blessing coming every morning. I pray for persecuted Christians because I know i got... Not only... I'm not doing it just to get a blessing. I'm doing it because God says to do it. This is how you stay in His will. This is how you know that, okay, I don't need... I don't even know what I need. I basically don't even know what I need, but I know what God tells me to pray for. I just want to be in his will. He knows better for me than me. So I pray what he tells me to pray. Okay? Well, over time we can see anybody who's blessed Israel has been blessed. Anybody who's cursed Israel gets cursed. It says it in the word and it's been proven historically over and over and over and over. And now here we have Israel regathered. We have Israel prospering in, in Ezekiel 37 like never before. I mean, the way they're growing crops, they found all this natural gas. I mean, just, just mind boggling, okay? So there's just no way. I mean, these are good arguments for the, for the atheist to hear. These are good arguments for the, for the backslider to hear that, oh my gosh, this guy's on fire. I, the rest of the lukewarm church doesn't really, they look like fake. This is the thing, okay, you guys? A lot of the atheists, they look at Christianity like it's fake because we don't have any, where, where are the men leading? Charles Spurgeon says, if you are more courageous for the world than Christ, then stay at home. Where are those kind of men? Those kind of men wake up the whole world. If people are willing to die, the disciples were willing to die. Torturous death, hammered, just the kind of torture you can't even imagine. People coming back from the military, they know that nobody would go to that kind of death. People that have seen a lot of violence, you would not go to that kind of death. Besides all the prophecy I'm, I'm helping you see, you just wouldn't go to a torturous death for a lie like the disciples did. So faith. That kind of faith, you're going to read the word and, and, and it's going to change you. And you're going to understand, and, and God's going to open it up to you. It's that faith, and that's what He's telling you. You need faith to read the word of God. 
No preconceived ideas on what it should mean. Ah, it's not fair. What about all this other stuff? That was me. So I'm not saying, that was me for a long time while I was in rebellion. Nothing was fair. I had it figured out. I was waiting for God to catch up with me because I had it figured out. I already knew God. I believed in God. I confessed him. I had been baptized. I had been confirmed. I had done all that. And after being a, a basically abused as a kid, I ran, I ran around. I ran away. I sold and trafficked drugs. I was violent in prison. And then God knocked me down. With seven years left, it was like scales fell down from my eyes. And I realized all my sins were against him. I could never repent like that before. Okay, so I now have a burden saying, oh, your word says this, and I don't want any of my family to perish. <sighs> so I, I, have, I believe, I have faith. Hebrews, now we're going to read some Bible verses that show you this. I love David Jeremiah, David Hawking's book. He puts the scripture together. He's been doing this for 60 years. He does it better than me. I've been reading my book and his book, my book and his book. Hebrews 11:3. 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were made of things which do, which do appear. Let me read it again. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So God spoke it so that things which are seen, so what we see were not made of things which do appear. So God is greater than us, but he spoke it by his word. Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So that's faith. That's what we believe. You keep knocking. Jesus says, um, Knock, ask, seek. Seek, ask, knock. These are action steps. Don't stop calling on him. It is... Faith that causes a person to pray to God and ask for his help in understanding the Bible. God wants us to know the message of Revelation more than we personally want to understand it. Psalm 119, verse 18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let me understand your law, Lord. The Hebrew word translated wondrous refers to that which is too difficult for normal human brains to comprehend. Psalm 119, 169 adds, Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. A clean life. This is where David Hawking talks about this. And I, I never looked at it like that. I just looked at it like born-again believer. I, I had lived in my sin for a while as a born-again believer. When, when all these things happened to me and I started writing and the miracle letter came in from this man, there was still flesh battling. It was hard to... I used to live as a big-timer. I used to have money, power, influence. So then I had to start off humble. I even went through a shelter. Okay, and it was hard. My flesh wanted to rebel. I hadn't been with a girl for a long time. So there was some rebellion. There was some flesh sanctification, but I hated it. I felt distance from God. Okay, there was no, I want the fellowship. I don't want none of this. I've tasted everything. It's not worth it. It's darkness. It leads to depression. It leads to cussing. It leads to needing to take every drug. I don't want that. I did that for a while. So that's what I mean about how I just don't like my sin. I don't want to be used by the enemy. I don't want, I don't want him to have any victory. I want all the victory to be, all the glory be to God. All, everything he does, everything's for him. So that's how I look at it. David Hawking saying a clean life, holiness, repentant, will help you understand the word. So my interpretation of that is, is while I was in rebellion, I wanted to self-rationalize everything. But, but, but. You know, people think I was a better Christian when I was still smoking weed. Promise you they do, for the most part, a lot of them, because I wasn't so judgmental. I was listening to Tupac saying, only God can judge me out of context. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's, that's sobering right there, you guys. Now, I, don't, I, I believe God heard me in my prayers while I was in iniquity, while I was in rebellion. Help! But a lot of my prayers were praying, my will be done. I asked for wisdom, strength, courage, and then whatever else I'd rattle off sometimes. But most of it, if you're in deception, is sorcery. Double-mindedness. If, if you're in deception, your prayers, you're not 
you're not in right you're not in right mind that's what it means about being double minded double tongued it says in revelation double minded it says in james all right first peter 2 1 through 3 wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word the word that ye may grow thereby if so be ye have tasted that the lord is gracious james 3 17 but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy when there is sin in our hearts that remains unconfessed and unforsaken, it is a barrier to our ability to interpret the Bible according to David Hawking. Obedience. Those who obey the teaching of the Bible have a better understanding of the Bible than those who do not. And he, and he leans on John 7:17 7, because Jesus said, If any man do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it is of God or whether I speak of myself. So he was speaking to the people. The spiritual man judges all things in the spirit, according to Paul, which means that by his word, you understand what isn't of God and you understand what is Babylon, what is of the devil. You understand, I, I, I have ears that hear error right away. Psalm 119, 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. Please don't think I'm bragging you guys ever. I'm just on fire for the word of God. I believe the word of God. It takes time, patience, and effort, but there is no substitute for it. So this is him explaining this. In Acts 17, 11, the apostle Paul commended the believers, the Bereans. These were more noble than those at Thessalonica, which he spoke highly of, by the way. Thessalonica was a poor church. And they believed the word of God because they believed Paul. So when we're in affliction, we believe easier. We believe we're like, hey, that dude wouldn't be willing to die if it was a lie. So they already were good. And he's saying the Bereans were even more noble. So you should always be searching the scriptures. I, I recommend if you watch YouTube videos, which we all do, read the word two times as much if possible. Pull up commentaries. So he's telling you, so we're seeing the Bereans, okay? Paul's story is amazing. To go from darkness to light, to be able to say it exactly like that in, in Acts 26, that his instructions were to open their eyes from the power of Satan to God. So one to God. It's one or the other. From darkness to light, to be sanctified for repentance, for the remissions of sins, for the remission of sins to be sanctified in me, talking about Christ. That's his instructions to King Agrippa. That's what he says. Jesus gave me these instructions. He had to let the Galatians know for two chapters because they were going back to the law and they were trying to profit off it and they were going back into the Pharisee mode. And a Pharisee is a way different thing than a person who believes the Word of God and says you're not living by the Word of God. The Pharisees want to put stuff on top of the Word of God. They all wash your hands a million times, carry things um, a certain way this way, no doing this. The, the God never said none of that, okay? That is what legalistic is. People think legalistic is believing the word of God and being obedient to it. It's not. Okay, it's 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so we see a lot in, in, in Timothy and in Thessalonians. Study, study, study. Be sober-minded. You guys, 50 times there's warnings. Be sober-minded. How did they know 5 out of 10 people are going to be on medications? How'd they know that? We don't see that in the Old Testament because the whole word brings more truth, more truth, more truth, more revelation, more revelation, more revelation. And then, boom, we're seeing what to be watchful for. And he says over and over again, study the word so that you aren't going to be rebuked. But if we're rebuked, it's okay. A rebuke isn't no big deal. It's just like I might be off a little bit. I need a little help in understanding something. Now I'm more free than I was before. 
The Greek word for study is diligence. Carefully search out the scriptures. Do not be embarrassed. Study with an intensity and an effort that is rewarded by God himself. Correct interpretation is based on careful study, being diligent and working at it. What about the different interpretations of the book of Revelation? Okay, so obviously he gets into the interpretations. He's definitely literal. So are the other men I mentioned. It's all infallible. It's all in, inspir, inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, for righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, so did you see that? That says it's good, all scriptures. So yes, context is very important. Yes, what's he speaking? What's going on behind the scenes? I see a lot of people who want to say context is so, so important and rightly dividing it. That part's not for us. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? But don't you understand that if context is that important, the letter to the Corinthians has to do with sexual immorality being kicked out of the church. And now you're saying that having any proper judgment is a do I mean, it gets gnarly. So I, I don't like to argue, but bottom line is it's all good. It says it right there. It's all for us to learn. You can go so deep into uh, context that you forget what, what the heart and soul of, of Acts 26 is that I mentioned with Paul. You know, and I don't want to put the guy's name out there. He's an amazing scholar, but I read one of his books and it put me to sleep. And it was so deep and so gnarly, but it forgot what Paul is doing. Yes, it gets into some super deep mysteries and everything like that, but come on. It's darkness and light. It's Satan and God. <sighs> so the writers of the Bible are not even to be considered the real author. It's inspired. Look at what 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, we read these remarkable words. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, that's Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Speaking of God, Jesus is the image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, the above passage teaches that God spoke directly and audibly to the fathers like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can keep listing all the prophets. I love them. The weeping prophet Jeremiah didn't have one convert in 40 years. So the way we measure things is not the way God measures things. In verse 2 it begins, Hath in these last days, but in Greek grammar says something very different. It says, Hath in the last of these days. The days are referring to the times of God speaking audibly and directly. There is coming a time, according to these verses, when these days will be brought to an end. When that day comes, it will be a message from God about the Messiah, His Son, and our Savior. Apparently, his son will be made known for his true identity as God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. We also see that in John, the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh. It's very important that we understand that this last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ, is God's final revelation to us. That's why we read in Revelation 22, 18-19, these serious words, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So that's a warning. Heavy warning right there, you guys. So now he talks about events. He talks about the rapture. The Great Tribulation, the Second Coming of the Messiah, the Millennial Kingdom. He does a great job. This is the best book I've ever read on Revelation, and I've read a lot. 
Many will say that the subject of the rapture of the church is not found in the book of Revelation. Few even argue that the rapture is not mentioned in the entire Bible. You guys have gone over this a lot. Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. Jesus was raptured, went through doors. Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives, or from the Mount of Olives, went up to heaven in Luke, and they were looking at him, and the angel said, Why do you look? He's coming back the same way. Um, Philippi, I guess, the Caesarea, he's helping the, um, the, Eno, the eunuch from Ethiopia help understand the scroll of Isaiah, and he gets raptured from one spot to another. We obviously know that there's a rapture. Or it's in the Bible, that's for sure. So then he goes over the different views. Some people don't believe in a future rapture. Some people believe in a mid-tribulation, a pre-wrath rapture view, a partial rapture, a post-trib, a pre-trib view. Those I'm not even going to get into. I see too many people fighting over it. Like, if you, a lot of guys that see it, 1,000-year millennial reign, which is so important, like I said before, because it shows that sin is still possible. We also see in Isaiah that if you only live to 100, you're considered a baby. The, only, the reason you only live to 100 is because you resisted living in the truth. Okay? That's teaching us more about sin and to preach holiness, to preach. I mean, look, you guys, you want revival? Revival is repentance, complete repentance. Look at the book of Acts. When they were on, on fire, the holy fire of God was so on, on fire in, in their works that there was a shadow cast by Peter that healed people. And if you stole money and you even lied and only gave half the property, dead right there. That is Holy Spirit, okay? Holy Spirit does not... If you put Christ on over the top of doing drugs, watching porn, and you call that revival, you're going to be babbling in tongues. You're going to be having false lying, lying wonders. You're going to speak lying prophecies. You're going to be... It's just... There's a huge difference between true repentance and true revival and a lot of the stuff we see that is not... So I'm not going to get into the views of that. We, we know what we believe that we don't know for sure. I mean, for me, I don't know what for sure. I like this argument. I like that argument. I really like Jacob Prash's argument. Really, his argument fits with David Hawking's. It looks like, you know, it happens here. We see Revelation show us what the throne looks like, what the seraphim and the, and the, and the cherubim look like worshiping God. And then we see the, the uh, elders worshiping God. And then eventually we see thousands upon thousands upon thousands. All nations, all tongues. That's the rapture to me. Right? So now we see a different context. I don't know when that fits exactly with Matthew 24 and the Luke version of it and the Mark version of it. And even John has a version of it. I don't know how they fit together perfectly. So I don't think God wants us to have a doctrine that would say that and argue about it. You see what I mean? If it doesn't look like it's supposed to be a doctrine, then it, we shouldn't really argue about it. There's a couple things that you can argue about. That, and when you bring up Trump, my Lord, Lord have mercy, Jesus, is what my grandfather used to say. I was watching uh, Charles Lawson. I love that Baptist preacher out of Tennessee, I think. And I was picturing my grandfather would have loved listening to him. <laughs> Grandfather's in heaven. Okay, so I think I'm about done for today, you guys. Because really the rest, he's talking about some rapture stuff that I don't want to get into. I'm either going to do a Bible study on one of, the book, one of the chapters of Luke. Or I'll start doing it on Thessalonians and Timothy. But I've been taking a break from Bible studies online. So he gets into some things, you know, the, he gets into some different things about revelation. Them that dwell upon the earth is always used about unbelievers. So we see different contexts. We see a lot in revelation about they would repent not. I mean, if you take the revelation literally, it changes how you pray. It literally does because you're praying for the martyrs. You're praying exactly what it says that they are praying. How long, O oh Lord, faithful and true until you judge their, their blood? The blood of the prophets. It's all part a part of it. The whole thing. He's been patient and long-suffering till the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. 
and and we are reaching by being on fire for God. We're reaching people that look at Christianity as fake, like Muslims, like like atheists, like people who have fallen away. If you read the Book of Martyrs, people came out of their sin because they were challenging the doc, the, the Roman Catholic Church's evilness. Okay, um, the hour of temptation he talks about that. That's the specific time. That looks like the last three and a half years. It's, what is it? 42 months, you know? So there's the, there's the uh, tribulation, and then there's the great tribulation. So the tribulation, we're, we might be in the tribulation. I mean, basically, we're in the tribulation the whole, our whole life. But then there is a greater level of tribulation as the signs start to happen, as um, the birth pangs, as the beginning of sorrows. As these three things are coupled together, which they look like now, Israel brought back as a nation, could be the fig tree generation, could be the one that sees it, it looks like it, I believe it. They become a nation in 1948, they're prospering, all these things we see in Syria right now, Isaiah 17, that it will be no more. We see them all grouping right there. We see Israel. Well, look, look at who's getting affected by the coronavirus. Look at who's getting affected by the plagues. Just look at it and you tell me what areas that's happening in? Massive persecution in those places in Africa. Massive hate of Israel and Christians in Iran. Okay? The coronavirus just went in there. Okay? China, massive. That is where it's happening. This is God showing us. So, he said there would be nation against nation. We've seen that our whole life. World War One, World War Two. So that's a section right there. And then he says there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. So there's three things coupled with each other that we're seeing in greater magnitude. Volcanic signs in the stars and the sun and the moon. So we see these things. Looks to me like we're starting to be in that uh, tribulation. Not great tribulation. Great tribulation would be when the unholy trinity, when the false messiah is presented to the world, So he gets into that. I love the book of Revelation. So if we're trying to put pieces of the Bible together, because Revelation makes you go back and look at Exodus, Daniel's like the bottom bunk of the top bunk of Revelation, all of these things. Jeremiah, he brings a lot of Hebrews into it. So if we mess up measuring Scripture with Scripture, that's not adding to, that's just doctrinally not exactly fitting right. You see what I'm saying? But saying that a, a three-foot angel took me up to the highest... Or I introduced him and brought him into my house, and his name was Emma, or her name was Emma, and there's no uh, female angels in the Bible, and, and, they, and they told me some weird stuff. That's adding to it. Mismeasuring Scripture with Scripture is not having the doctrine perfectly sound. You know, that's basically the way I interpret this. So we're allowed to, you know, te you know try to fit it together. This stuff fits together. Okay, the, the word from is not Greek word, is not the Greek word apo, but the Greek word ek, which means out of, means removal. So he's talking about, so he's talking about rapture, harpazo, whatever other words I'm not remembering right now they use for it. Rapturo, harpazo. So what he's saying right there is that means not simply protection. The Greek word means snatch. So that's his argument that there's a rapture for the people that say there isn't. If believers were being protected, we have a huge problem in Revelation because most believers are killed during the tribulation. Conclusion, church age believers will be removed from the coming tribulation. Okay, he, he says straight up, do not argue over when. And I think his view is pretty much not like, you know, some people believe we're not going to see anything. And it, it, I believe we're going to see some stuff. I believe what Jacob Prash does and what he's saying right here, the wrath of 1 Thessalonians 5.9 is he says it's hell, not tribulation. Not, believers aren't appointed to wrath. But it says that we're going to see the Antichrist come first. Now, if you really look into, Re into Thessalonians carefully, there were people that were instigating that the rapture already happened. See, you don't read that. Most people don't teach that. But when you really break it open, that it, all you have to do is read the verse, too. It's, it, and he says it very clearly that it didn't already happen. So they were freaking out. Like, did we miss the rapture? So those were the false believers. I don't know if they were false believers. So, so we see that some are deceived... And they're also deceiving others. So I don't ever want to attribute 
a false teacher, a false prophet, if they even know what they're doing. It's not my business to, I just can see if they are false, but maybe they're in error, maybe they're deceived, maybe they had some kundalini spirit put over them in some weird Toronto fire thing, and whoa, making all these crazy noises and doing all this weird stuff that's not Holy Spirit. Maybe they didn't know, I don't know, some people want to attribute, oh, they're satanic. How do you know? What I do know, it's not holy. Fruit of the Holy Spirit is, is not the yelling and the tripping out. And that imparting thing, you guys, that's dangerous. When you see that lady impart something into a kid and he starts flopping, oh, now he's got it. No, yeah, now, he, now you just gave him something that wasn't holy. Okay, so the rest of this goes into pre-trib view. So I, I see, you know what? I see it like this right here. Basically, Revelation 6.17 announces the opening of the sixth seal. Okay, so that's where we start seeing where things change. Big time, right there. I'm not going to get into that right now. See, this would be a great Bible study if I was able to show you all this on a board. That's why I do like Andy Woods. Some people, he has all the same beliefs. He sees a few things a little differently. Not worth arguing over, but his Bible studies are so good because he shows you characteristics. You see it, you can learn together. It's like reading the Bible in a way. This is not. You have to trust my word for it and go search it out. Revelation 16 describes the wrath of God. Oh, let me get back to this. Revelation talks about massive earthquakes. It talks about hailstones 100 pounds. It talks about all kinds of stuff, volcanic activity. It talks about all this stuff. So having the literal view, you wouldn't be praying it away. You would be saying, hey, that might be God's will. I'm praying that more people come to knowledge of Jesus Christ, turn their life to Jesus Christ. It's affliction that brings us. Do you see what I'm saying? I saw a lot of people posting something about that Australia fire. And I was like, hey, I seen two guys out there preaching the fire of God to repent. And they were saying this is the wrath of God on how they've fallen away and they're, and they're okay with homosexuality in church. I don't doubt that they're right. They're preaching, they're preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So then I saw people saying they were praying it away. And I'm like, okay, well, how, about, how do you know that's not God's will? Then I saw them passing around a New Age thing, Gaia. And it's literally, you know... Way, way new age. So with the, with the literal interpretation, we look at everything like, hey, this is God's will. This is God's will. God's used uh, all this in the past. He's used locusts in the past over and over again. Hey, as a matter of fact, every single thing that happens is the will of God. That's why we're supposed to thank God in all circumstances, for it is the will of God, according to uh, Paul. Okay? So now he gets into some other things, and I'll be done here. I do want to mention these because these are really good, and then I'll be done. So let, we just talked about enough of that, but now let's look at Matthew 25 because he goes over some other things. Matthew 25 speaks of a marriage on the earth, the bride's future home. The meeting in the air speaks of going to the bridegroom's home when we are raptured. Another reason I preach so hardcore, you guys, is because I believe there are levels of heaven and levels of hell. I believe the worst of the worst that are using the word of God the wrong way go to the worst places in hell. Okay, I believe people that are pedophiles that never are repentant have the worst of the worst. I believe that. I believe that there's a judgment seat of Christ, that there's five different crowns given. I believe, Daniel, when he says that there'll be some will rise to everlasting shame and contempt and others will rise to uh, everlasting glory and and shine like the stars in the firmament who brought many to righteousness. Okay, so I believe that. I believe standing in the gap, preaching the word of God, being willing to die for the word of God. I believe the word of God that the martyrs are the closest to God. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't preach it. So most believe that I, that I and, and I see it a little bit, but I don't see it enough to say it with authority that I've seen David Jeremiah say it, that he believes after the rapture, there's and that's the judgment seat of Christ, and then he comes back, rule and reign from um, Mount of Olives, Israel, Mount Zion, and for a thousand year millennial, and we're, we're as priests and kings, and we're ruling and reigning with him, and if you read Revelation, you see that they have to overcome, and he has these works against you, but if you overcome, so that's other levels, 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 if you don't overcome, so there's a lot of like, hey, exhort 
So he's talking about marriage. Another thing about those parables, many were invited, but few chose to come, you guys, which all of these things lead back to that hard verse that narrow is the way, okay? So when you take it all together, that verse isn't just doesn't stand out by itself. If it did, it'd be different. But it all points toward that verse. Matthew 8, 11 says, We are going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they are not resurrected until the end of the tribulation period, according to Daniel 12 that I was just talking about. That's interesting. There's other verses that say first, you know, basically last breath here is first breath there for Paul says that. At the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air, but at the second coming, we are with the Lord on the earth. Okay, so that's that what I was just speaking of. So there's a little in, in between time, that 42 months. Looks like it to me. At the rapture, the Bible says the Lord comes for his saints, but at the second coming, he comes with his saints. Amen. Hallelujah. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, one of my favorite, God gave me that the day my nephew died. I was like blown away. All the other miracles he did, that one overdid them all. That one did them all bigger than all. Because at that point in my sanctification process, I was reading a chapter a day. And I started to Psalms, went to Revelation. Psalms to Revelation. And about the third time, the day my nephew passed, I got chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians which is the rapture verse, the, the trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise. You know, uh, do not, you know, do not be sad as an unbeliever would. Comfort each other with these words. I've been able to use that word, verse to comfort many people that have lost a loved one. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52 speaks of the last trumpets, another rapture verse. Seventh trumpet begins to blow at the middle of the tribulation and blows until the end. So if the Lord doesn't come until the last trumpet is blown, he would have to come after tribulation. So there, so that's his argument against post-tribulation. All right, that's enough for today, you guys. God bless you guys. Be, in, be encouraged, be empowered. Don't fight over dumb stuff. Myself included. Sometimes I like to stay silent for a while and just read the word. We're all, we're all works in progress. We love you, Jesus. We love you so much, Jesus. We love to just say who you are. Hallelujah means praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Anytime anything's going on in your head you don't want, say praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. I sometimes am woken up in the middle of the night having to do that. I don't take any medications or anything. I saw so much violence in my life that I used to have to shake my head. I don't have to anymore. God bless you guys. Be encouraged. Be empowered. Love on each other. Dear Lord, do not let, any, do not let the enemy come between any marriages. Keep the marriages healthy. Keep the kids healthy. Lord, I pray that you would encourage and empower believers to speak your word boldly in truth. And that there would be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And that in that truth, we will be so bold that we will see the plans of the enemy clearly for what they are. And that it won't just be one or two of us. It will be more and more of us. And we will see the plans of the enemy. And with love, we will tell the truth in love that that is not of God. Come over here. God loves you. He wants to save you. His son died for you. Come over here. No to all these different sexualities to kids. No to men kissing men. No to this adulterous stuff. No to that. And we show the word. And we believe it. And we receive it. Okay? And we stop being double-minded. And we, st Lord, we want that. We want that outpouring. We want that boldness. We want that freedom. There's no condemnation. No condemnation in Jesus. No fear in Jesus. Everlasting life. So we pray that. We believe that. We preach that. God bless you guys. Hedy, I can't wait to see your interview. I don't even know. Is his name? Wait, Spencer? Spencer Smith. Gosh, that guy's on fire. 
He hasn't called me back. Alex, God bless you, Alex. David Smith, God bless you, brother. You're a soldier for God. Stephanie, God bless you, sister. You guys have a blessed day.